Now, here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are on the ground at the R&B uh, building. It's the headquarters of Intel Santa Clara, California. And we're actually in the Intel Museum, which I've never been to before. If you get a chance, stop by. There's a lot of great things. Back to the first memory that looks like it was hand sewn, uh, early microprocessors, computers, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And we're really excited to be joined uh, by our next guest, Kim Stevenson, the VP and CIO of Intel. Welcome, Kim. Jeff, how are you? Last we saw you was uh, at Oracle Open World, I think. I can't believe it's almost been a year. It's been a year, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been keeping busy. Things are hopping down here. And we're joined here by your, your leadership group. And I think it's really interesting. We just had a nice conversation with Leslie Berlin about Robert Noyce and really about kind of culture and, and the culture that he had, the culture mm -hmm. that he built with, with Andy and with Craig. And Intel has a very specific and very defined culture defined by really strict meeting rules and regulations, which anyone who's uh, been here knows, you know, constructive confrontation. You know, there's a very distinctive Intel culture. Talk yeah. about, about that culture and how it enables Intel to, to A, kick out really great microprocessors and a whole host of other products, but to continue to grow as a company and, and to continue to change in this very dynamic marketplace. Yeah, so it's interesting because <clears throat> people talk about founder DNA and so, you know, um, we're uh, you know, 48 year old ish company now. Um, but there's still founder DNA. In fact, you walk into this building and there's Robert Noyce's famous quote, don't be encumbered by history, go off and do something wonderful. And every Intel employee today still embraces that. It's, it's very much a part of our culture and how we drive um, uh, the company. But, you know, history repeats itself in modern ways, too. So um, the um, strict meeting thing, you know, we do a lot of meetings at Intel, but um, they're global, they're diverse. You know, people are working from a customer location, a home at their office, you know, wherever it might be, there's a lot more flexibility um, to map to the modern needs of the workforce. So, right. so founder DNA is still there and stuff, and then the changes needed to succeed in today's environment um, complement that and add on to that. Yeah, like I said, I, I just always remember the stories of Andy being outside at eight. That's what they teach you when you first show up. You know, meetings here start at eight and they start on time and they start with an agenda. And, and you think about it really from the manufacturing point of view. I mean, my, making microprocessors is a very specific and intense technological process. The bunny suits are not just for fun. They're because you can't have a bunch of uh, particulates and, and contaminants in those fabs. So it's interesting how it kind of grows out of that manufacturing because now when people think of Silicon Valley, I think they think more of usually software and more of kind of the software defined world, but under the covers, right, uh, even with cloud, it, cloud means somebody else's computer. There's a, there's a computer there somewhere and a lot of them are running on x86 uh, yeah. technology. Yeah, it's, um, so look, you know, you, you look at corporate values and the values that um, we embrace at Intel and certainly results uh, orientation is one of them. So that's the discipline and the uh, um, activities it takes to drive to the results. And then customer orientation is the other one. You know, we're trying to invent things that make a difference in the world, right? So where we can bring, and if you think about it, um, Intel has probably touched every human on earth with the core of their technology. Um, they know that through PCs. Um, as we move into the future of Internet of Things and even quantum computing, um, it may not be as obvious that this wearable bracelet that I have on watch today, that's an Intel product, right? So, um, so there will be many manifestations of, of how we impact the world, but it's still true that you know, um, the core of what Intel does brings smart and connected devices to every person on earth. Right, and continues to, to morph how that's done now, more with data centers to support cloud applications because some stuff's done on the device, some stuff's done in the cloud, and as you said, Internet of Things is coming in a big, big way. We just talked to Bill Rue uh, at GE uh, a couple weeks ago, and he talked about, you know, it's great to work at GE and at Intel because we work on really big, really big problems that impact a lot of people in a major way. And that's a pretty special opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's you know, there are piece parts that people talk about, but if you think about um, everything as a system, um, what you see is that the advances in data and analytics that allow for rapid insight development through machine learning and, and um, 
deep learning kinds of algorithms to the ability to collect data through Internet of Things devices and provide real-time feedback, it's fundamentally changing every industry. So you get to, you know, a, what is a normal fitness device becomes in the future a connected care device to manage you know, chronic illness throughout the world to change the outcomes of patients um, that suffer from health issues. And so, you know, these things start as pieces and then they move into these fully connected systems. And that's kind of the um, uh, next, what I'll call explosive wave of computing. And it, it goes up and down the stack from, you know, very small embedded uh, chips and things to, you know, phones and tablets and servers and, you know, massive supercomputing right. power. Right. And then there's delivering that to your customers and then there's integrating all this, this new stuff internally. Big data analytics, um, you know, being on top of your own systems, things in the cloud. You talked about a changing culture where now people don't have to be in the meeting rooms upstairs. They can join from wherever their remote location is. You, you're well known as a really super innovative CIO. You get a ton of demands on your time, not necessarily to keep the lights on and run this company, but also to, to tell other people about some of the innovation that you're up to. How does what you're up to in kind of running the internal systems map to the external innovation that Intel's delivering within the pro products and, and, uh, and services that they're delivering to the end customers? Yeah, well I have the pleasure of leading a very, very talented uh, IT organization and um, the um, innovation and the thought leadership that this team brings to Intel is amazing. And, um, and we add value. Um, we certainly keep the lights on. I, I mean, <clears throat> you know, operational discipline, no company can run today without an outstanding fundamental operational team in IT. And, um, and that's an important role, but it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and so we look for opportunities based on the business strategy of Intel that bring greater value to Intel. Um, and you'll see that we, we um, have worked on a project for a couple of years and keep adding pieces to it. It's an advanced analytic predictive uh, modeling based on machine learning that takes a lot of external data associated with um, market sales of our products. So, so we make things that go inside things that get sold to the customer. So try to end the, uh, understand the end product and then br bring that back to manage our channel and how we um, take our route to market for a particular product. And um, what we've been able to do through those types of machine learning algorithms is drive $351 million of revenue last year for Intel. And One more time. So $351 million. <laughs> that's a big number. That's, <laughs> a, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of revenue. Yeah, yeah and it, but it's, it's critically important because what's happening is our product portfolio is diversifying, is expanding. As computing expands, what we sell expands. Right. And so you have different channel partners, you have different needs, different market segments. And so understanding the performance of those market segments to be able to relate to that customer need um, in a different fashion is what the machine learning algorithms allow us to do right. that we couldn't do before. Right. Maybe one really great sales guy that knew his customer could do it, that you would get this wide variation in performance where the really superstar would perform and then everybody else. And if you put machine learning to it and you take what a human can know and put that intelligence into an algorithm that allows that to be distributed across a wider population and then you get improved operational performance. Right. Now, so. I'm teasing you because, you know, we, we do a lot of shows and it's, that's always the conversation, right? Can the CIO get a seat at the business table and go from, yes, we have to keep the lights on and keep all that stuff is, didn't go away, but can we deliver more value add? And, and, you know, you're kind of a personification of actually executing what a lot of people are trying to achieve, striving to achieve, thinking about achieving, starting to plan, but you're really executing it here on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah, it was, and I'll tell you, it starts with you have to understand um, um, why you exist, right? And I, I do believe we, we exist for three reasons, and that's, you know, we do have to run the, run the operations of the company, allow the company to operate, so that's, you know, and we you do that, you get to move up to creating this business value through understanding and collaborating with the business unit, but then ultimately, you're looking to do things that the business units inside your company think are impossible. Now through, because <laughs> most companies, 
most companies are not made up with people who really understand technology. So who in the company would that be? That would be the IT organization. And so the IT organization then has a responsibility to bring the transformative notions of what IT can bring to the company, to the right. marketing of the company, to the operational discipline of manufacturing, to um, uh, you know, whatever, to how to recruit and retain. Where is the best talent in the world, right? Technology can help you solve those problems. And, but IT, by understanding it, needs to bring those ideas, and that's the seat at the table, right? right? right. But they're, they're the transformative nature of where the company is going, what problems do you need to solve for the company, and then how might technology help? Right. And that then leads to industry leadership. Right, because I actually believe that will define, if that operating model works well and the company executes to that, that will define what, in every segment, what industry leadership is and who will lead. Right, or get left behind. Or right? get left behind. Do it and get right. out in front, right. or you know, right. the, the, uh, the view in the back of the dog pack never changes on, and the, the, uh, on pace, the dog sled. The pace of change is, um, I know people say this all the time, but it is phenomenal. You know, even, even I look back at some of the, things that I was working on a year before and how I thought about things and how, how much more um, advanced those thoughts are in just one year. Right, right, right. And so it is a profession that is ever learning and, and you, have to, um, you have to be able to stay up uh, on that. Um, but like I said, you know, you have to also have the context of history so right. that you know um, some of the barriers that you're going to encounter and how do you get ahead of those so that you can remove those before they actually slow you down. So, so let me ask you a nitty gritty question that, that I, I love to ask people because we go to all these conferences, right? We're at the Spark Summit, Spark's the hottest thing in big data and then, and then we're at cloud and, and you know, there's, there's just so many technologies coming at you. I always like to say it's kind of like uh, you know, driving through a snowstorm at night with your headlights on, you know, it's just like big data and, and, and their uh, open source projects. How do, you, how do you make sense of it? On one hand, you, you, wanna keep, you wanna keep a finger on the pulse. If there's something you need to be involved with, you need to know about it. On the other hand, you know, if you reacted to every single thing that came your way, it would be, it would be just uh, paralysis by, by analysis. I mean, there's just <laughs> too many things. So how do you kind of balance that? How do you keep an eye on the future see what things you need to see so that you, you don't miss, but at the same time, not get completely blown away by just way too many uh, new yeah. technologies coming in. So, um, look, it's, um, I always say the shiny toy problem, right? Oh, right, now right, you right. shiny toy. Um, and, and we do some cool things as uh, technologists, especially in this area, in this industry. Um, but it really comes back to staying focused on what problems the company needs solved. And some of those are hard multi-year problems and, and you have to allow for some experimentation in that area. Some of them are practical, um, it's just practical innovation, you've got to just stay focused and do the work. You do have to know what kind of problem you're solving, not just what the problem is. Right. Um, and then you know, apply the right kind of resources. Um, you know, some people are better at the day-to-day -day execution. Some people are better at, you know, really wallowing in those tough, complex challenges that no one's ever solved before. Um, uh, and, and we're fortunate here that, you know, we, are, we have a lot of people that are um, really um, want to solve some of the problems uh, that haven't been solved before. We have a brand new data center uh, just across the courtyard here that um, has um, one of the world's largest supercomputers and certainly the largest in a, a public enterprise. Uh, national laboratories have uh, right. ranked above us, but um, that was designed to solve, you know, a particular problems that we believe we will face in, you know, as we move from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer technology. And so, you know, we're constantly thinking about um, three, five, ten years out, and what problems do we have to solve? And that's a different skill than the day-to-day -day execution. Right, right. So. so that gives me, uh, we're running out of time, kind of the, the last question, and, and you, you teed it up nicely. Talk about, you know, the role of diversity. Obviously, you're a woman in tech, and, and we featured you before, and, and, and we love to feature you and, and other great women CIOs specifically. Um, but it's not just women, right? It's diversity. It's, it's kind it's, of different it's points of view. You know, how are, are you 
both a appreciating it and, and how is Intel kind of actively promoting the, the ability to get different points of view because it really uh, puts a different lens on problem solving. You know, you'll see things right. that you maybe never saw before. We just interviewed um, uh, a guy from Aetna who said, you know, she's always put the same person on the same job. That person was no longer available. She gave it to somebody else and they said, why are we doing it this way? We could do it a completely different way. Never even, never even a, a thought to, to do that. So yeah. how are you guys executing that? Um, practically as well as kind of institutionally. Yeah, so philosophically, right, it is it exactly what you said, that um, diversity of thought and perspectives leads to better outcomes. Um, and so gender diversity is a piece of it, skill diversity, experience diversity, um, cultural diversity, all those things play, play in. Um, we made a um, uh, bold, declaration at the beginning of 2015 at the Consumer Electronics Show that we would be at market parity for diversity by 2020. Um, and we just released, um, I believe it was either early August, late July, um, our very first mid-year um, diversity report. So, so part of our philosophy is make bold goals, um, very consistent with Moore's Law, make bold goals, figure out then how to solve them. So we made the bold goal at the beginning of the year, right? Then we're starting to work it, but show your progress. Um, and um, we've made great progress. And, and there are areas that we're falling short too. It's, it's, it's not all perfect. Um, but by exposing that, getting more people involved in the dialogue, guess what happened? So we open up to the ecosystem help us build a pipeline of tech, and then we get thousands of ideas submitting in to what we could do, what kinds of programs we could run with universities. That's led to a partnership with Oakland City Schools, right, that starts, you know, children very young to try to stay in tech. We can't think of all of those ideas. What we can do is inspire a community to help bring that to bear, and that requires bold goals with transparency, uh, and reporting, and so um, so we're really pleased with with the progress. Um, um, I, I can you know say that we're um, committed to follow through. Um, not, I'm sure we will run into challenges like everyone else has, but um, the overwhelming support that we have from our employees um, and the broader uh, technology community has been phenomenal. It's inspiring other companies to do similar things, which you know, then you get a movement. It's not an right. initiative by one company, it's a movement that then takes over. So we're pretty excited about uh, progress. And so, um, and I can say for, you know, personally, I see no limitations um, for me. And, and if I can get, you know, every diverse person in the world to say, I see no limitations for me, I think we will have accomplished our goal. Well, that's a, that's a perfect close here at, at R&B, the Robert Noyce Building, at the Intel Museum, where you're surrounded by, I'm still mystified by how any of this stuff works. It's, it's amazing when you look at these microprocessors that, you know, what they can accomplish. So it, it is all about having bold goals and, and going for it. So, Kim, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes out of your busy day. Thanks really appreciate it. In. Absolutely, my pleasure. So I'm Jeff Frick with Kim Stevenson. We're at Intel headquarters, R&B building at the Intel Museum. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.